thank you, Chief Judge Bell um, and Chief Judge Barbera for your leadership. Um, it is so awesome to be here and to be receiving this award. I um, am a great admirer of Chief Judge Bell, so to be receiving something that is in your name um, is incredibly special, um, not just for really early, early years um, in the Baltimore City Circuit Court. But when I was able to serve on the ADR Commission, um, I found then that we were incredibly social, incredibly aligned on social reform issues. And what I learned over the course of time would be every idea I took to the chief, he raised his eyebrows, I knew I was in. He liked it. And if I was really cooking, he'd say, Rachel, Rachel, come here. <laughs> And if there were an idea I had, and uh, he said something like, well, <laughs> let's think about it. I knew that it was something that he kind of liked, it just wasn't the right time. And you've made these references, Chief Judge Bell, um, to the vineyard. And indeed, uh, it was that vineyard um, and the season and the timing, so much of which, through the lens of a system, I learned from you, that things take time and we will sow and we don't always harvest for a long time. But some ideas I would share with the chief, especially um, over the years and the commission disbanded and I became one of his six advisors and he would look right at me and he'd say, next. <laughs> I knew that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's really a joy to be receiving this award. You know, no one gets an award like this without um, a whole lot of friends and people behind them. And I am looking right ahead, and I it's a huge night for me because my wonderful husband, Billy, and our five children, uh, Paula, Pete, Dewey, Archer, and Dutch, um, have joined me and my sister, uh, Elizabeth, from Bethesda. And you know, that's really, isn't that always the wind behind the sails? <laughs> Thank you guys for being here. And my team, um, you know, Baltimore Mediation's been at it for 25 years, and uh, they are, not everybody, they are sitting right there, please stand up, you wonderful team, right? And Vicky and Dusty, go on, Nicole, Andrew, Beverly, right, Jennifer. There's Maggie, but she's recording something right now and coming over. Just an amazing group of people dedicated. Um, they know their theory. Uh, they know why we do what we do. And uh, they, are, they too are, are in the field. So I'm really grateful and I receive this on, on behalf of, of you all as well. You know, I asked Billy, um, what in the heck should I talk about? Because I actually was tasked with giving you a talk for about 30 minutes or so. And I'm like, oh, I'll make that this one short. <laughs> but, you know, Billy said, well, I don't know, Weezy. He said, just tell him why you do what you do. And so um, I thought that I would take the time that I might have uh, left and say that I think we all do what we do because it's tied to our values. And so I thought I might uh, take a, a brief look at uh, the values that shape us and those that have shaped me and my views of where we are and where as a field, an ADR field, it's an interesting analogy with all the sewing and that we are a field, uh, where we might, might be going. And um, I really think that our work so many of you have said this over the years, is a vocation. When you are committed to conflict resolution, conflict transformation, there is much more than just a job. There is a vocation. And you know with every vocation, there is uh, time to be able to think about why you do what you do and a time of formation. And for me, 
I realized my formation started very, very young. Yes, I was a uh, corporate litigator. Um, I did leave uh, along a big firm and I went out, as they say, I jumped off the cliff. And one of the partners at Whiteford for whom I did so much of my work, he put his arm around me the day I told him I was leaving and he said, what? You're doing what? And he said, you know, the pavement's cold out there. You'll be back. And um, I knew he cared deeply for me, but he did not see what I saw. And he did not see what you all saw whenever it was that you entered the profession. So that long time ago decision did not just come out of the blue. It has definitely taken us to places we never imagined. Uh, working with the Hopi Indian tribe was asking about that, working with merchants in Milan, working with immigration in Greece, working with Fortune 100 executives and, and all the complexities that they moved through, having to mediate between the board of directors and what it is that they need to do with cash flow. The different kinds of matters in Baltimore from uh, <coughs> Strever brothers calling us in after the Honeywell oil spill and all of the development down in Bells Point that we mediated for a number of years. Uh, the BSO strikes, uh, the consultations that we've done, our most recent work in training the safe streets violence interrupters um, that were on the scene along with one of our uh, team members uh, the day of the uprisings. Um, the, the work that has taken us uh, into the bedrooms and into the kitchen tables of all the thousands of families for whom we have provided mediation services in the divorce arena. Um, it has really been a, a privilege and all of our work, no matter what it is, has been dedicated to face-to-face, face-to-face negotiation, face-to-face -face dialogue. And that has actually been a, a big commitment. And it, and it came, as we all think about what we do, from a time when I was very young. And so I'll tell you a couple little things that really have shaped that value and why we do what we do. When I was a really little girl, uh, and I'm thinking about my dad, and we lived in New York, and I had a, the experience of what it is like at a very, very young age to be believed in. You know, my dad was this amazing engineer, uh, MBA inventor, and he works for a West Virginia paper company, which was uh, Mead West Vaco. And he saw things that people needed. He looked at what women were doing and he wanted to invent paper bags. He saw what teachers were doing and he invented color corrugated paper. And he also invented the first disposable little black paper dress for the traveling woman <laughs> in 1959. And I love that because my dad saw women in the way that I hope I have become. Well, our dad uh, was tragically killed. And gosh, I was only three and a half. But you know, I remember so vividly two other experiences when I would be peering out the front door. One was after a blizzard, and I was in my uh, little snowsuit. I was watching him plow and dig out, I mean, a big blizzard. And he came inside and he said, come on out, little girl. That world is waiting for you. And I remember another time peering out the front door of the glass and it was raining. And I, my mom had me all my little slicker and boots. And he came behind me and said, go on out there, little girl. I know you're made of sugar, but you're not going to melt in the rain. And you know, that's about capacity. People believing in you to be able to go out because they know that you have a place in the world. And our mediation practice 
is based on that. My mom, very, very early times and then all the way through, she has given me the model of what it means to be resilient. She lost the love of her life in that commercial airplane crash. She remarried. She was divorced in a very painful experience dealing with alcoholism, being wiped out financially, and domestic violence. She remarried a third time, her grade school sweetheart. And even now, in late stages of Alzheimer's, she is an optimist. She might not recognize us any longer, but she is always positive. And she was a devotee to Emily Post. I don't know if you all know Emily Post, you know, the American author on etiquette, etiquette in society, etiquette in business, etiquette at home. Well, my mom's Emily Post books were dog-eared and browned because she was always thumbing through for us. And it was uh, please and thank you, stand up tall, smile, count your blessings, uh, don't ever complain, hold the doors for other people, and keep on marching. And I am grateful for that because our mediation practice has really been centered around resiliency believing in others, and my mom's way of being a host, a hostess. She knew civil engagement. She knew how to make anyone comfortable. She treated everyone with warmth and respect, and it didn't matter who they were, and she always Always, it's a big word. My mom always took the high road, no matter how atrocious or outrageous someone's behavior was. And she would say on a number of occasions, they're just stewing in their own juices. You don't need to add to it. And I think that is in so many ways what our practice has also been based on, a transformative approach to mediation. People come to us stewing, and we ourselves know what it's like to be in those situations. The graciousness that we can afford them is quite tremendous. I was gonna tell you about other things that have shaped my values, uh, but I will fly through them, except to say that I am a Midwesterner and big skies and possibilities um, are, yeah, are, are a big part of, I think, what our team has been devoted to um, and what we know. You know, the idea of, you know, you get into a political argument with someone when I grew up and they would be a lot of them chuckling and somebody would slap somebody else on the back and say, just may the better man win. And my grandmother would wink and she'd say, woman. And I think of those wonderful Midwestern values. Um, I want to simply probably share one other piece, and that is that another person who really influenced me, and I'm thinking about you, you perhaps have been influenced as I by your parents, but also by a grandparent. And uh, my grandma, Lily Hun, she gave me the value of what it means to break down barriers. Her husband was also, um, he died, time of World War II, leaving her with uh, four little girls, ages two, four, six, and eight. And he ran a filling station. And when that filling station, Sinclair Oil, and that license was being taken away from her, she needed to provide for her family. And she didn't take no for an answer. So she drove in a roll top Jeep open, put on her very best Sunday suit. We were told it was yellow and a yellow hat. And she drove from Springfield, Illinois to Chicago to a board meeting. And she wanted to know why that license had not been given to her. And she entered a room, as we were told, full of power brokers, 
all men wearing their fedoras and chomping big cigars and lots of smoke and three-piece suits. And they said, Mrs. Hunt, we don't give licenses to women. And my grandmother, who had been seated at the end of a table, so she stood up and she said, gentlemen, has a woman ever asked? My grandmother drove back to Springfield, Illinois, and she ran that gas station. And not only did she run that gas station, but she had a clientele of the widest variety of ethnic people. It's the neighborhood she came from, and those were her peoples. Her partner, was Albert, who had been my grandfather's mechanic. And Albert was black. My grandmother was always about pushing through barriers, but never with hostility, never with anger, never with violence, with forthrightness and dedication, and because she too believed in what was possible. I want to give a couple more pieces about, briefly, what I'm thinking about our field. Because don't you find that you too, when you look back on your formation as a child, that we're the luckiest people around because we have found a profession that marries that value system to our everyday work? I mean, that's just the kind of thing that, uh, it still tickles my toes, it'll never ever get old. But what I see ahead for us as a field is that the fact that conflict affects people in their bodies and in their minds and in their souls, we have yet to even tap into our programs and into our offerings. Thinking as a system about what it is that's possible, and how it is, for instance, that we might expand possibilities like the language of mediation to facilitate a dialogues on the front end of every matter that's been filed in the court system. With the neutral, with the goal not to settle or resolve, the goal to have a facilitated conversation about what this matter is all about, and if it is to proceed forward, what that would entail. Can you imagine the change, the reform that we could make in Maryland, even if we did a pilot program on that? I see facilitated dialogue clauses as standard in contracts, in the construction industry when they're partnering on the front end in the government when there have been shutdowns and there have been slow pays. In every kind of employment contract, imagine not an arbitration contract, not even a mediation contract. Why? Because mediation is still highly settlement oriented. But a facilitated dialogue clause in those contracts for all the same reasons that I just mentioned. We have a skill set and we have a worldview that is desperately needed. And if we even look at our lawyer entities, I mean, think about the MSBA, the dispute resolution section, or MVLS, or Maryland Legal Services, what it would be like if we offered, you know, 30 minutes of listening hotlines. You know, there's a lot of anger and a lot of ideas and a lot of viewpoints that really have no place to go. And if you are interested, as I, in science and looking at neuroscience and quantum physics, conflict is energy and it needs a place to go. So what if we had hotlines like that? And what if, as we are graduating, if you will, all this amazing wisdom of our elders, right? People who are like even 60 or older, and I'm getting there. What if we had programs like Mediator On Call, uh, where seniors, as they're exiting, I mean, we probably never retire, right? What if we were 
partnered with mentoring people who are entering the field one to three years and the idea would be to be on call immediately for a difficult community gathering a difficult conversation a bad board meeting whatever it is for one time and then be the bridge back to the bulk back to the professionals who want to earn their living in conflict resolution what if we created systems that worked for all the different people and the different needs and also called upon the wisdom of our elders as well as be it took care of those who need to be taken care of on the other end i, I just think about I want to be dedicated to more of that, more well-being in the world. And I really believe there's a huge life for conflict resolution and for mediation outside of litigation. <laughs> Those of you, and there's so many of you in this room, I know, and my friends over the years, you know that we have not relied on the court system for our work. <laughs> we have been in the business uh, arena, and we have been in the arena where people want to avoid litigation at all costs. It's a huge yearning out there that we could really um, be much more a part of as leaders, as lawyer leaders and non-lawyer leaders. So I think about things like relational advocacy. I think about things like the adversarial ethic and how it has so permeated our lives, all of our lives and how it, it just tears down our communities. And I think about something new that I'm calling Tribe Think. And the idea of we have people whom we care about and love, like in this room. And it feels good when we're together because from a value standpoint, we share a lot of the same values, right? And we like to see each other. I do, I know I will own that piece. I love you guys. I mean, talk about tribe, 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 tribe. But tribe think is when we forget to make room at the table for those other voices. We, we forget that even that voice that we roll our eyes at and we say, there is just no way, still is a human being, in, in my view of the world, still is someone made in the image of God. There's something divine about each of us. Where can we create a space at the table for humanity in our political discussions, which are raging right now, and in our home discussions? And that's of great interest to me. Because when we're just with our tribes, we tend to push out things externally and to not be, we don't need to be, interested in them because we have each other. And I think we could push on that boundary and say we do need each other. And more than anything else, we need all of us as conflict resolutionaries, taking us way back when. I want my children to be conflict resolutionaries because I know they already are. They've chosen uh, positions in their work and in what it is that they are doing in their lives where they're making a difference. I'm so proud of you guys. Uh, Billy and I have so many things that are underway with regard to being relational and wanting to really help and be part of an evolution. We do, there is an evolution happening, right? It's uncomfortable right now, but come on. We know about you form, you storm, and you norm, <laughs> right? And if we thought our field was at all complacent, or if there's any malaise around what do we do next, there is so much next. And I'm very hopeful, and I know and believe that you are as well, and we will go back to our fields, and we will sow again tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, because it's never, ever old. It is always fresh, and there are always people who don't have what we have, this amazing skill set, to whom much is given. I can hear my mom and my grandma saying, and you know the rest of it. To whom much is given, much is expected. So thank you so much for this. I am truly honored. I love you. I think our work is about love. And let's, let's go do more of that. Thank you.